Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA. Mark and Margaret Yako Jolene, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHill.org. When you work at a greenhouse, there are jobs that are pleasant and some that are definitely not. One of the jobs that ranked on the fun side was delivering flowers to customers. As soon as they got their driver's licenses, even our kids enjoyed making deliveries to people in our county. Every flower delivery brightened the day and brought smiles to our customers. I'm host Mary Holm, and come along with Prairie Yard and Garden as we meet another Mary who grows flowers to brighten the day for her customers too. Mary and you work with flowers or plants, you often hear the nursery rhyme, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? Today we are visiting with Mary Solbrecken, who has a flower farm contrary to the usual corn and bean farms we are used to seeing. Thank you, Mary, for letting us come and visit your flower farm. Thank you. I'm glad that you're here. Please tell us how did Rustic Designs Flower Farm get started and what all do you do now for your business? Well, um, Rustic Designs started out, I was making rugs. I was making rugs on a loom and I decided to start selling them. So I was trying to come up with a name that would be fitting and you think of the rag rugs and they're more of a country style. So and we lived on a farm, I'm a farm girl, a country girl. So Rustic Designs just kind of fit. Um, I've been making rugs for at least 10 years now. And then about four years ago, I decided that, you know what, I have a degree in horticulture. I want to grow flowers, sell flowers. Um, so it just kind of blended right into that. So I still sell the rugs with the flowers. So that's just kind of, it's been expanding year after year. The garden's been getting bigger and bigger. And now I'm up to two acres of cut flowers. Um, I bring them to the farmer's markets. I do subscription deliveries to different homes. Um, deliver to the Belgrade grocery store weekly during the growing season. Um, different businesses get flowers. I have people that come out for tours or classes. I do special events. It is something that I love to do and I plan on doing the rest of my life. Mary, how did you end up at this location, at this farm? Well, um, I grew up just about, probably about eight miles, um, kind of southwest if you're over in Highway 71. And my parents had purchased this farm location, I think the year that I graduated from school in 95. And um, the people that lived here had life estate to live here as long as they lived. Um, so this is just a really great farm site and it really goes with the Rustic Designs name. The, everything is just has that rustic character to it. The barn has got so much character, the greenery shed, um, it just really, really draws. It really is very fitting. Um, they used to milk cows here back in the 70s, um, probably 60s, 70s. And actually the straw that I use in the gardens here is original straw from the 70s yet that they just never got to using. So it works really good for um, laying down my pathways. Um, it's just great and I, I think I'm making them happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. What kinds of flowers did you decide to grow or how did you experiment to figure out which ones you wanted to grow? Well, I grew up growing flowers. Um, I was in 4-H. I had a huge flower garden as a kid. Um, both my grandmas had huge flower gardens, so I grew up with them. I exhibited at the county fair. I did the local flower club had um, their flower shows. So I would exhibit there. So I already kind of knew as a kid what flowers last or what flowers make good cut flowers in a vase. 
Um, and then combined with a horticulture degree as well, I learned more on, on that fact and how to um, preserve flowers and that type of thing. And then also my experience in working in the flower shops. I worked at a couple of flower shops after college and I learned a lot more on the design work part of it, um, the flowers that customers are used to getting in or used to seeing, so I try to grow a lot of those. But I also like to grow more specialty or novelty cut flowers as well. Do your flowers that you grow change throughout the season, whether, you know, spring, summer, fall? Yes, they, they do. Um, in, you know, in the spring, I have tulips, daffodils, allium. Different flowers bloom later on to the season. And you all know, start out with some of the perennials, like in June and July. And then beginning of July, the end of July is one of the annual start, because that's I direct seed them into the ground. And some of them I do start in the house. I do have um, grow lights and growing trays, too, that I do start some in. Um, so then, you know, July, August is a lot more of your annuals that are growing and blooming, as well as some of the later season perennials as well. So there's a lot of different options. And I go all the way until it freezes. And even when there's a frost coming, I run out with my blankets and I'm covering things. And I want to save as much as I possibly can because I have customers that are at the market Saturday morning that want those flowers. So I try to keep as many things going as possible. So what makes a good cut flower? Yeah, you want to have something that has a longer vase life. I like to shoot for something at least that has five days, um, preferably the seven to nine to ten day um, range. And also something with lawn stem length. I, you need something that's going to be long enough to put into a vase or container. Um, and also a sturdy stem. You're looking for something that's going to be strong and stand up good for you in a vase. Um, those are basically the three main things that I look for. I do grow some things that have a shorter vase life. There's more demand out there for like the dahlias. Not all dahlias are going to last that long. There are some that only last three days. But there's demand there for like wedding work or people are just really in love with dahlias right now. There's um, a strong demand for them. So I do grow a lot of them even though they don't have the longest vase life. When is the best time to harvest them? There are certain flowers that you want to pick when they're just starting to open up, kind of like the sunflower, just when their petals are peeling away from the disc of the sunflower, you want to pick them. So I want my customer to have the longest base life possible, so I will pick them as fresh as possible. But then there's other flowers, like yarrow especially, you want to pick that when it's definitely open. You don't want to pick in the early stages, otherwise it's going to wilt in the customer's vase. Um, dahlias are another one where you want to open or cut them when they're completely open. You want, otherwise they're just going to wilt, they're not going to last the day. Um, so every flower really is, has a different criteria for picking. I pick in the morning for the most part. Morning is good. The only one bad side to the picking in the morning is the flower is out of its sugar. It's used up all of its sugar that it produced. It collected the sunlight from the day before, produced sugar, so it's living off of that sugar all night long. So in the morning it's low on sugar, but it's nice and crisp and fresh. So morning is a great time to pick. Otherwise, late in the evening is another great option. Um, the thing with the evening picking is the flower is a lot hotter. It's been out in the sun all day. It's you know kind of stressed from the heat. But the other thing is it's high on sugar content at that point. So there's kind of drawbacks of both sides. I mean, both are good options. Either early in the morning, I like to pick by 9 o'clock for sure. I'm out in the gardens picking at 5, 5.30. I want the flowers nice and crisp and fresh. Otherwise, I would suggest in the evenings, you know, 7, 8, 9 o'clock, just when it's starting, the sun's starting to set, that type of time frame. Uh, when I cut my flowers, I bring out the buckets right out to the garden area. I already have them filled with water and I put in a holding solution. It's a number two crystal holding solution and it kind of holds the flowers at that point of bloom. Um, so I will cut into that water. It's like lukewarm water and then I will let them drink up water for a couple hours and from that point they get put into the coolers. I have a couple floral coolers. Um, the coolers are set anywhere from 33 to about 40 degrees um, just to condition them, get them nice and crisp and cool and then they're ready for when I need to put them into arrangements or when I'm putting together bundles for a market, that type of thing. There's a couple flowers that I well cut and put into a hydrating solution. Uh, the hydrating solution basically um, pulses in um, nutrients and water into the stem right away um, just to hydrate them basically and keep them nice and fresh. From that point, after they've been in the hydrating solution for about four hours, then I'll transfer them to the holding solution. Um, when my flowers go to customers, if I'm doing a vase arrangement, they get put into a number three. It's a vase and vase florals uh, preservative that they get put into, and that's for the, the flowers to keep on blooming, to make the buds open up, and to keep on feeding them sugar. Same thing with the farmer's market. They, the bundles go out of packets of flower food, so the customer, when they get home, they can put that flower food into the vase and have their flowers last for them and keep on blooming. How do you transport all those flowers to your customers and to the farmers markets? When I go to the market, I have, for the most part, I use my trailer. I have an enclosed trailer. 
It was an old Boy Scout trailer that I came across that has great shelving units in there. And I had my father-in-law kind of modify it. Um, so my buckets, I have the black floral buckets and they sit right in. He made a really nice shelving thing so it won't, they won't tip over. I just set them right in. It works great to bring them to the market. Would it be possible for you to actually show us some of the flowers that you grow for your customers? Oh, sure. Come along. We'll go look. When I, um, I do plantings of a container with using um, flowers like petunias and whatever, the, the principles that I've heard are that you use a, a thriller and a filler and a spiller. Do those same uh, design principles apply in floral arranging too? Yeah, I guess they kind of do. Um, when I teach my flower arranging classes, I kind of um, tell the the participants that you want to start with your filler flower in your arrangement just kind of give some crisscross motion to help hold up the, the focal flowers which would be your your um, thriller your your thriller flower would be like the lilies here they're your focal point or like the dahlias would be a focal point or some flowers would be another focal point um, your filler is going to be anything like your baby's breath um, like the yarrow even the the sea holly the larkspur we another type of filler flower kind of fills out the arrangement um, good options for your spiller would be like amaranthus is a great option, Dusty Miller, or anything that has kind of a natural curve that's going to kind of fill or spill over the vase, over the edge of the vase, kind of gives you that, that um, spiller portion of it. So I guess that kind of does go into floor design as well. Um, one thing that I do teach in my arranging classes is to have something with some height to it, to give your arrangement some depth. Um, so a lot of times I'll say to, you know, to pick out a vertical flower, like the, the Larkspur is a nice vertical flower. Snapdragons are a great vertical flower to use. Um, delphinium, gladiolas are even nice tall uh, vertical flowers. So something to give your arrangement height and depth um, is really key to arranging. Well, all of your flowers here are absolutely beautiful. Do you uh, provide extra water for them or how do you grow them in the summertime during the dry periods? Yeah, I, um, if it doesn't rain, yep, I have to be out here watering. I have um, a tripod watering system. I actually have three of them and I use hoses and move the tripod along. Um, it really works good. It does cover a large area and I water during daytime hours. You don't want to be watering into the evening because otherwise you're going to have a problem with um, the powdery mildew building up. So um, you definitely want to be watering during the daytime hours for that. And then like the dahlias that you were talking about and um, some of the gladiolas, do you save the bulbs from year to year? Yeah, I do. Um, everything gets dug up. The gladiolas, the calla lilies, um, tuberoses, dahlias, they all get dug up. Um, I store them in file crates, the plastic file crates. You can find them at like Walmart or Office office max um, so that they can breathe. There's air flow through there so I dig them up, I wash off the dirt and I store them in the crates and we have an old farmhouse that we live in and the basement has a rock um, foundation and it's a really stays cooler down there so it works out a great spot to store them. So the whole area is filled up with dahlias and gladiolas and cow lilies. Um, so it works out good. It's a lot of work, but it's well worth it. You had mentioned that with the Dusty Miller that you use that as a spiller sometimes. or, mm -hmm. But to me, that doesn't seem like it's a, a plant that grows very tall. How do you get it tall enough to be able to use it? Yes, that's a great question. Um, a lot of times I do plant my flowers way closer than what I would ever suggest. And the reason that I do that is to get longer stem length and also to cut out the shade out the weeds too. There's kind of, you know, a couple different benefits to it. So I will plant my sunflowers close together, my larkspur close together, my gladiolas and dahlias, they're right in beside each other, right in a row. Not what you're supposed to do, but it works to get me a taller stem length and it helps to shade out those weeds so I don't have to do so much weeding. Oh, that's a great idea and a great suggestion for our visitors too. Yeah. So you mentioned that you like to have something that's linear to add a lot of height and interest. Mm -hmm. What do you like to use for fillers? This is a sea holly that you had asked about. This is a great filler flower to add into your arrangement. This would definitely work for the filler when you're putting together. Um, this is called blue glitter. Um, sea holly is a common name for it and it just has a really nice texture to it. Great for arrangements, nice stem length. Um, vase life is amazing with it too. I mean it can last for a couple of weeks. It works really good for a dried flower too. It's excellent. And then here I also wanted to show you the larkspur. Larkspur is what's going to give you your depth to arrangements and give you your height and your depth and it's something that I really tell a lot of my participants in the flower arranging class to so use something with some height. 
um, to bring up your arrangement and also to give more depth to it as well. It works really well for that. Well, and I see that you have some phlox growing right here too. I would guess that that would also be another beautiful flower to give you that linear look. It is, it is, and it also has a great fragrance. Phlox is probably one of my favorite flowers to grow. I do have it in whites, lavenders, orange, and red. It is a great flower, and even there's some of them starting to bloom already. Um, usually they don't bloom until the end of July, beginning of August, so it's pretty amazing to see that. But that would be a great filler and also a height, so it kind of acts as two different things, that, you know, with your criteria for making an arrangement. Speaking of making an arrangement, would you be willing to show us how to make an arrangement? Say, for example, that we have company coming for the weekend and we want to go out to the garden and cut some flowers. Could you do us a simple arrangement to give our customers, or I mean our viewers, um, an idea of what they could do? Sure. Yeah, let's go do that. I have a question. I'm thinking of starting a pollinator garden. What kind of plants do I use? Yes, it really does matter. We're doing some trials on counting the pollinators on different kinds of zinnia and salvia here at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, and we found it really does make a difference. This short, newer variety is star white, and that's an improved variety. It's very good for disease resistance, but we've seen very few pollinators on it. Right beside it is an older seed variety called Lilliput. It's lily put because of the little flowers, but it's still a fairly tall plant, two or three feet tall. This has been a great attraction for honeybees, bumblebees, and butterflies, and native bees. So we've seen quite a few on lily put. State Fair is another older type that's very good. And then when we've compared salvia, we have a salvia farinacea here that's called mealy cup sage. It has kind of a white dusty look to the flowers. This can be blue or white as you see here. This is a big attraction mostly for bumblebees. Uh, but some honeybees as well. This is our typical salvia splendens, a one called flare that we think of mostly for annual salvias. We've just seen a few pollinators on this, some honeybees. They have to go way up inside this flower to get the nectar. So they actually crawl way up in here and they're totally hidden when they get the nectar. But we haven't seen as many bees on this flare salvia as we have on Farnesia. Farnesia or mealy cup sage is a great one to plant in your garden. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Mary, this is the bucket of flowers that I cut earlier this morning that I'm going to be using to put together an arrangement. And I'm just going to kind of show you how to put an together an arrangement for um, the, the audience out there. Just so if they were going to make some flowers, they were going to have dinner, they're hosting company over tonight, um, they could go to their own garden. They could probably find a lot of flowers similar to this. So I'm just going to show how to make a simple arrangement, nothing too fancy, just um, something for the special occasion to have the neighbors over or something like that. Um, so, so to start out, I went and got a vase and I filled it up with water. Now when you put water in a vase, you want to make sure that you use water that has not gone through your softener because if it goes through your softener, it'll have salt in it. And not that it's going to kill the flowers, but it, it just isn't going to be very helpful to them at all. It's going to be a little more on the harmful side. So something without any salt in the water. Um, next I'm going to add in a flower preservative. Um, the flower preservative contains an acidifier, a biocide, and a sugar ingredient. The biocide is to kill the bacteria in the vase. The acidifier is to um, keep the flowers their color. If they did not have the acid in the flower, the acidifier, it would cause the flowers to turn more of a bluish shade, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, the sugar is to feed the flowers, to keep them blooming, to open up the buds. Okay, so now I have the flower food in there, and you can see by looking at the bottom, you can still kind of see the white powdery mixture in there. Um, so what I'm just going to do is I'm going to take a stem of lily here. This is the Asiatic lily, um, and I'm just going to take off some of these bottom leaves because I don't want any leaves to get in the bottom. So I'm just going to stir up the flower food so it's all dissolved, that type of thing. Um, then, to start off with an arrangement, I suggest using something linear first to get your height and the larkspur is a good ingredient for that. This is larkspur here, 
And once again, I'm just going to strip off the bottom leaves because I don't want any leaves below the water level that will cause bacteria to grow. It's a little windy here at this location. And I give it a snip, kind of at a diagonal crisscross there, and I'm going to stick that in. So Why did you make a diagonal cut? Um, just so it can absorb up more water. It's easier for the stem, more um, surface area for the stem to drink up water. So once again, just strip off the leaves, and I'm going to cut at an angle, and insert. Um, basically, you want your arrangement to be one and a half times the height of your vase. And once again, I'm not going to put this whole big clump in there. It looks kind of like a tree. So I'm just going to cut off a branch and strip off the leaves and add it into the arrangement like so. And keep on adding in until you get a nice crisscross motion inside the vase. The more of a crisscross motion that you have in there, it helps your next flower to put in there, which is going to be the focal flower. So I'm just going to add in a few more of these. Keep on inserting around, and then we will probably quit at that point with that. So next I would suggest adding in your focal flower. That is going to be your largest flower that you have that you want to draw interest to the arrangement. And this here is an Asiatic lily, and this is going to be the focal flower for this arrangement. And once again, I'm going to kind of eyeball it. I'm going to look at the vase, and I want these to be kind of down lower because they're a big flower. They give weight to the arrangement. Um, so I'm going to kind of eyeball it. I want it down low in the arrangement. Cut at an angle. And just let it drop to the ground. <laughs> Strip off the bottom leaves, and then insert it into the arrangement. And we're just going to work our way around the arrangement. So I'm going to grab another stem of lilies here. And same thing. I want the... Over on this side, I want the flower down low. So just kind of use the table as a guide. Strip off the bottom leaves and add in the lily. And it looks like we have an opening right here where I want to add one more. So yeah, if you could hand me that next stem of lily. I think I will take the one that has the most buds open and then this one that just has one open, we will add to the top. So I'm like, once again, I'm just going to kind of eyeball it. Do you, is that a special scissor that you're using too, or a clipper? It's just a simple shears um, from Menards is where I've gotten them. Uh, works really good. It's a nice, nice utensil. I, I like using it a lot for this. Sometimes I do use a knife, but for the most part, I just use it shears. Now this one here, I want to bring up a little bit more height into the arrangement. So I'm going to try to get the lily right there at that point to fill up that hole there and cut at an angle once again and make sure try to get those leaves so they're not in the water i do see that i have a couple in here in the water so i'm going to try to quickly pull those out a little bit um at that point now i want to add in a little bit more of an accent flower and something linear to it to give some depth so i'm going to go with the snapdragon here this is a chantilly uh, snapdragon it's not your common rocket series snapdragon that you see this has more of an open look to the snap um, they're newer on the market and once again it's pretty much I want to add some height and some depth into the arrangement and I'm just going to kind of work my way around the arrangement adding in color cut at an angle strip off the bottom leaves and insert and we'll go with a couple more in there and I'm just going to rotate my vase and I'm going to add another one over here in this area and then also one on the back side so once again, just eyeball, cut, strip off the bottom leaves, and insert. And we need one more. Kind of just makes the arrangement nice and uniform to have one more over in this area. So balance is something that you really work to achieve too. I do for the most part. You know, if it's going on a table, you kind of want it to be uniform. It just really depends upon where you're going to put it. Um, then I'm going to add in another accent flower, and this here is called Dianthus, and this is in the Amazon series. It's a really nice flower, um, nice and bright color to add to the arrangement. Nice summer colors we got going on here. So I am going to start off, I will start up high, so I'm going to start up right there at that point and add this in there. And once again, same thing, strip off the bottom leaves. 
And I'm going to add this in right over here on this side here. Kind of wiggle it in there. And then I need to add in a couple more just to even it out a little bit. Kind of eyeball it, cut at an angle, strip off the bottom leaves. And we're going to add this right in there like so. And I need one more over in this area. And I just want I'm going to kind of tuck in a little bit into the arrangement just to give a little more depth. So I'm going to put it closer to the level of the vase. So I'm just going to kind of add some depth. It's, it's fun to add depth to your arrangement. Just gives more of an eye-catching look to it, I guess. Draws interest to it. So we're going to try to sneak this guy in there. I have to pull off a couple more leaves for that. Oops. All right, Mary. So I'm just going to add in one more flower, and that is this Aclelia here, this white flower, and it's just going to make everything kind of pop. Um, so once again, too, I'm going to pull off those leaves, just strip it, and you're going to look for the holes in the arrangement or where you need to add something. So like right here in front, I have a hole that I want to add in some white flowers, too, and it just adds uh, so much to the arrangement. Um, this is a great filler flower, and so I'm just going to keep on working around and finding those holes, those areas where I need to add a little bit more to the arrangement just to make everything pop nicely. So, and then I see in this area here I have another hole, so I want to add in there. So we'll take this guy and I'm once again strip off the leaves and cut at an angle and pop in. Just like so, and I'm just going to keep on working around finding another hole that needs to be filled or another area where I need to add in some white which I think I'm just gonna go right over here at this point here and get it down in there like so um, and I'm adding one more I think I got a little area here that needs something just to fill it out and when you're making an arrangement you want to but it looks appealing to your eye it doesn't necessarily have to look appealing to everyone's eye is what makes it appealing to your eye so there, I um, think that pretty much sums it up. A nice full arrangement. Um, it's be perfect. Are you having company tonight? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. This is beautiful. And thank you for letting us come and see your flowers here at your farm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering a CIRA. Mark and Margaret Yako Jolene, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHill.org